Good afternoon. Um, I hope you hear me well. Uh, if not, please just uh, leave a comment in the in the chat session. My name is Ines Arias. I'm a policy and project officer at Yuri Heat and Power, and I will be moderating this webinar today. Thank you again for joining. Uh, this, this webinar is organized uh, by the European project SDHP2M and REN21. So just as a short overview before we begin, just wanted to um, say a few words about what REN21 is and SDHP2M. So REN21 is the Global Renewable Energy Policy multi-stakeholder network that connects a wide range of key actors to facilitate knowledge exchange, policy development and also joint actions uh, towards a rapid uh, global transition to renewable energy. And the SDHP2M is a European project under the Horizon 2020 framework that stands for Solar District Heating from Policy to Market. This is a project that works at the regional and at the European level to achieve the market update of solar district heating. On the agenda of today's webinar, uh, we have three speakers that will cover the matter of REST integration in DHC and more specifically the integration of solar district heating. We will start from a global perspective to then narrow it down to a European approach and then we will finalize by uh, giving best practices from a Swedish perspective. In this sense, uh, our first speaker will be Hanna E. Mordak. She will provide an overview of the general renewable heating and cooling sector and she will highlight uh, some developments in district heating globally. The second speaker uh, will be Laure de Chantre. She will focus on a European level, um, more specifically on solar district heating status, and she will present the solar district heating project and its latest developments. Then the final speaker, it's uh, Professor Jan Olof uh, Dallenbach, and he will introduce us to the best practices of solar district heating uh, from a Swedish perspective. Please note that you can participate actively um, after each presentation and during the question and answer session by just uh, clicking um, in, the, in the chat session and we will then just pose your questions to the, to the speakers. So without more deletion, I would like just to present the first speaker. Her name is Hannah E. Murdoch, as I said. She is a project manager and analyst as, at REN21 where she coordinates the Renewable Global Status Report, which is one of the most referenced reports on renewables worldwide. She also leads RUN21's uh, data collection efforts for the One Gigaton Coalition. This is uh, an initiative that uh, is organized also by the United Nations Environment and the New Region Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs. And she is also currently serving as a teaching assistant in the International Energy Program at the Science Po Paris School of International Affairs. So, Hannah, please, uh, the floor, or in this case, the screen is yours. All right. Uh, thank you, Inez, and thanks to everyone joining us for the webinar. I'm Hannah Murdoch, uh, the project manager for the Renewable Global Status Report, which is the flagship publication of REN21. And uh, the Global Status Report, or GSR for short, was launched just last month at the Clean Energy Ministerial in Beijing on June 7th. So today I'll take you through some of the main highlights of the report with a focus on the heating and cooling sector. So just as uh, a bit more background following uh, Inez's uh, introduction of REN21, uh, we are the global renewable energy multi-stakeholder network that connects the wide range of actors. Um, contribute, uh, we're dedicated to the rapid uptake of renewable energy worldwide, and we bring together governments, NGOs, research and academic institutions, international organizations, and industry to learn from each other and build on successes that advanced renew renewable energy. 
The Renewables Global Status Report provides an annual look at the tremendous advances in renewable energy markets, policy frameworks, and industries globally. We use both formal and informal data to provide the most up-to-date information available, and this year's GSR marks 12 years of REN21 reporting. Over the past decade, the GSR has expanded in scope and depth of its thematic and regional coverage, uh, as well as the refinement of data collection, which goes along with the tremendous development in renewables over the past decade. This year is also the first time we included a new chapter on enabling technologies and energy systems integration, which uh, includes technologies that share the potential to facilitate and advance the deployment and use of renewable energy. And this year we've covered uh, storage, heat pumps, and electric vehicles. The GSR is also the product of the GSR community. Um, it's a product of the systematic data collection resulting from the thousands of data points and the use of hundreds of documents and personal communications with these experts from around the world. We benefit from our multi-stakeholder community of over 800 experts and for GSR 2017, we had country information for 155 countries, which was rece received by our contributors, and this represents 96% of the global population. We also have a, the Renewables Interactive Map, which is a research tool for tracking the development of renewable energy worldwide. Uh, it complements the perspectives and findings of the of the GSR and REN21's regional status reports by providing infographics from the reports as well as offering detailed and exportable data packs. So now jumping right into the findings of the latest edition of the GSR, um, many records were achieved during 2016 with 176 countries having renewable energy targets and renewable energy auctions were held in 34 countries, which is more than double the year before. A record 161 gigawatts of newly installed renewable power capacity was added, with solar PV accounting for nearly half of total additions. For the fifth consecutive year, investment in new renewable power capacity was roughly double the investment in fossil fuel generating capacity. And for the third consecutive year, global energy related CO2 emissions from the energy sector remained stable and this was despite a 3% growth in the global economy and increased energy demand. So in short, it was another extraordinary year for renewables. Total global renewable energy capacity was up 9% compared to the year before to 2017 gigawatts by the end of the year. Solar PV saw record additions and for the first time accounted for more additional power capacity than any other generating technology. In terms of heat, solar hot water capacity increased by nearly 5%, rising to 456 gigawatts thermal. As of 2015, renewable energy provided an estimated 19.3% of global final energy consumption. And of this total share, traditional biomass, which is used primarily for cooking and heating in remote and rural areas of developing countries, accounted for about 9.1% and modern renewables, not including traditional biomass, made up approximately 10.2%, with biomass, geothermal, and solar heat together accounting for 4.2%. The overall share of renewable energy and total final energy consumption has increased only modestly in recent history, and this is despite the tremendous growth in the renewable energy sector, particularly for solar PV and wind. A primary reason for this uh, is the persistently strong growth in overall energy demand, um, with the exception of the, the momentary pullback in 2009 following the onset of the global recession. Um, and this persistently strong growth in demand counteracts the strong forward momentum for renewable energy technologies. And in addition, the use of traditional biomass for heat, which makes up half of all renewable energy use, has increased but at a rate that's not kept up with the growth in total demand. The Global Sales Report provides an overview of renewable energy champions in different areas. 
looking first at annual investment um, and capacity additions in absolute numbers, the top countries for investment in um, renewable energy, power, and fuels were China, the US, uh, United Kingdom, Japan, and Germany. However, looking at investments relative to GDP, you get a completely different list of countries. Um, with the countries now being Bolivia, Senegal, Jordan, Honduras, and Iceland, which clearly highlights the rapid advancement of renewable energy in developing countries. And for solar water heating capacity, the top five countries were China, Turkey, Brazil, India, and the US. Looking at the champions when it comes to total renewable capacity installed, in absolute figures for solar water heating, uh, the list reads China, US, Turkey, Germany, and Brazil. However, when looking at capacity um, per capita, the list reads um, entirely differently with the five leading countries being Barbados, Austria, Cyprus, Israel, and Greece. And similarly for geothermal heat capacity, though China, Turkey, and Japan lead in absolute figures, Iceland, New Zealand, and Hungary are in the lead when considering the capacity per capita. So overall, modern, modest improvements were achieved in renewable heating and cooling in 2016, but the sector is still constrained by low fossil fuel prices and the lack of policy support. Modern renewable energy supplies approximately 9% of total global heat demand. In 2016, the vast majority of renewable heat continued to be supplied by biomass, with smaller contributions from solar thermal and geothermal energy while additional capacities of modern bioheat and solar thermal were installed in 2016, growth in both markets has slowed. Um, district, heating, district heating systems are also incorporating solar thermal energy for larger installations, and interest is expanding in the use of district heating as a way to provide flexibility to power systems by storing energy from the electric power grid as heat. This reflects a more general increased interest in electrific electrification of the sector. And in general, however, deployment of renewable technologies in this market continued to be constrained by a number of factors, including uh, comparatively low fossil fuel prices and um, lack of policy support, as mentioned before. Um, in as in past years, policy support has been specifically focused on power generation uh, and support for renewable technologies in the heating and cooling and transport sectors has developed at a slower pace. As of year end 2016, 126 countries had enacted power policies. 68 countries worldwide had policy frameworks for renewable energy in the transport sector. And this is an increase of only two countries from the previous year and 21 countries for renewable heating or cooling policies, which is the third year in a row that not a single new country has adopted a renewable heat obligation. So as in the power sector, renewable heating and cooling technologies generally are promoted through a mix of targets, regulatory policies, and public financing. During 2016, most government support for renewable heating and cooling was provided through financial incentives in the form of grants, loans, rebates, or tax incentives, which are aimed at increasing deployment and, in some cases, incentivizing further technological development. Countries have also adopted regulatory mandates, which often are enacted through building codes or, in some U.S. states, through the inclusion of renewable heat in RPS policies. Several city governments also implemented mandates specific to renewable heating and cooling in 2016, uh, joining cities such as Barcelona, Sao Paulo, and uh, Shenzhen in China, as well as 903 mun municipalities in Italy with existing mandates. Cities also have focused on linking renewable energy to district heating and cooling networks. Carbon pricing policies. Um, either carbon taxes or emissions trading systems were in place in 57 jurisdictions worldwide in 2016. And if well designed, carbon pricing policies may incentivize the development and deployment of renewable energy technologies across sectors by increasing the comparative cost of higher emission fuels and technologies. 
However, some uncertainty still exists as to whether these mechanisms alone are sufficient to drive the deployment of renewable energy, even if well designed uh, due to other factors at play. Looking now at jobs, um, the renewable energy sector employed 9.8 million people in 2016, which is a 1.1% increase over the previous year. And excluding large-scale hydropower, these jobs increased 2.8% uh, to 8.3 million. Solar PV was the largest employer, followed by biofuels, large-scale hydropower, wind energy, and solar heating and cooling. Specifically for the heating and cooling sector, the number of uh, solar heating and cooling related jobs declined by an estimated 12% due to contraction in the market. In China, which is the, the dominant market, employment fell yet again as annual installations continued to decline. And other significant employers in the sector included Brazil, Turkey, India, the United States, and Germany. But overall, despite losses in some of the major markets, uh, the global employment numbers continued to rise uh, due to record deployment of all renewable technologies driven by falling prices and supportive policies in several markets. Trends in renewable energy investment uh, varied by region, with investment up in Australia and slightly in Europe. It was stable in India and down in the other markets. Global new investment um, in renewable power and fuels, not including uh, hydropower projects larger than 50 megawatts, was $241.6 billion in 2016, as estimated by Bloomberg New Energy Finance. And although this represents a decrease of 23% compared to the previous year, the decline accompanied a record installation of renewable power capacity worldwide in 2016. And investment in renewable power and fuels has exceeded $200 billion per year for the past seven years. While developing and emerging economies overtook developed countries in investment for the first time in 2015 for renewables, um, developed countries took the lead again in 2016. Uh, note, however, that these estimates do not include investment in renewable heating and cooling technologies. So turning now to the technology-specific developments in the heating and cooling sector, um, biomass accounted for 14.1% of the total final energy consumption, which is up only slightly from the previous year at uh, 14%. The contribution of bioenergy to final energy demand for heat in buildings and industry far outweighs its use for electricity and transport combined with traditional biomass uh, continuing to make up the, ma the majority of biomass consumption. The global market for wood pellets for industrial use and heating um, has continued to expand with uh, around 14 million tons of pellets going to heating markets, notably in Italy, Germany, and Sweden. This is for individual houses and district heating. And in Lithuania, wood chips have overtaken natural gas as the major fuel in district heating schemes. In Eastern Europe, the market for bioenergy in district heating has also continued to grow. An estimated 0.4 gigawatts of new th geothermal power generating capacity came online in 2016, bringing the global total to an estimated 13.5 gigawatts. Um, India, Indonesia and Turkey were in the lead for new installations. Um, but Kenya, Mexico, and Japan also completed projects during the year, and several other countries had projects under development. Also, expansion of geothermal direct use continued in 2016, including several district heating systems in Europe. The single largest district uh, direct use application is estimated to be swimming pools and other public baths, followed by space heating, including district heat networks. And several EU countries have added direct use capacity through the continued expansion of geothermal district heating. Concentrating solar thermal power saw 110 megawatts of capacity come online in 2016, bringing global capacities to slightly below 4.9 gigawatts by year's end. 
this was the lowest annual increase in to total global capacity in 10 years at just over 2%. But even so, CSP remains on a strong growth trajectory with as much as 900 megawatts expected to enter operation during the course of 2017. Uh, some CSP activity continued in Europe during 2016. Um, in France, nine megawatts, um, a nine megawatt facility was under construction. Uh, and in Denmark, a hybrid biomass CSP facility um, that will incorporate 17 megawatts of CSP was under construction. And as a uh, CHP plant, uh, the facility will generate both electricity and low temperature heat for district heating which represents an important potential application for CSP in colder climates. Solar thermal is used extensively in all regions of the world to provide hot water to heat and cool space, to dry products, and to provide heat, steam, or refrigeration for industrial processes or commercial cooking. And by the end of 2016, solar heating and cooling technologies had been sold in at least 127 countries. The cumulative capacity of glazed and unglazed collectors in operation increased to a year in total of 456 gigawatt thermal, up from 435 gigawatt thermal a year earlier. Solar district heating enjoyed increased attention um, in China and across Europe, led by Denmark, which had a record year for new installations and experienced the fastest growth of new solar thermal capacity among the top 20 markets. Denmark also brought into operation 31 new solar district heating plants and expanded five existing plants uh, for a total of 347 megawatts thermal added in 2016. This was nearly double the capacity added the year before. And as in 2015, the top five countries for cumulative capacity were China, the United States, Turkey, Germany, and Brazil. Solar thermal collectors of all types provided approximately 375 terawatt hours of heat annually by the end of 2016, which is the equivalent to the energy content of 221 million barrels of oil. District heating systems are incorporating solar thermal energy for larger installations, and the successes in Denmark have inspired intensive discussions and project development activities in other Central European countries, especially in Germany and Poland. In total, Germany installed a combined 9 megawatt thermal in four new systems, increasing the country's district heating capacity to 39 megawatt thermal by year's end. And uh, in addition, two other solar district heating plants larger than uh, 350 kilowatt thermal began operation in Europe in 2016, um, <clears throat> in Sweden and in France. Due to low fossil, file, fossil fuel prices throughout the year, new global installations of solar thermal systems declined again in 2016. Um, the year's gross additions were down by 8.5% by from the 40.1 gigawatt thermal in 2015. The significant slowdowns were reported in uh, Poland, France, Austria, and Israel. Um, among the 20 largest markets, significant market growth was reported in Denmark, Mexico, and India. Uh, in Denmark, this was 84%. And as in 2015, the five leading countries uh, were China, Turkey, Brazil, India, and the United States, as shown here again. So in recent years, the markets have been, transition have been transitioning away from the residential sector to large-scale systems for water heating in multifamily buildings and in the tourism and public sectors. Over the last five decades, the primary application of solar thermal technology globally has been for water heating in single-family houses. Um, specifically for Europe, newly installed capacity in 2015 was primarily for domestic hot water systems for single-family houses. Globally, however, in recent years, markets have been transitioning to large-scale systems for water heating in multifamily buildings. <coughs> 
And as I had mentioned uh, at the beginning, this year was the first year we included a new chapter on enabling technologies and energy systems integration. And since we're looking at heating and cooling today, I'll mention some of the highlights um, here that are applicable. Uh, globally, the use of heat pumps continues to rise, particularly in new efficient single family homes with a low heat load and seasonal storage for heat generated by renewable energy for district heating systems uh, continued to be used in several European countries and in Canada in 2016. Um, these types of seasonal storage systems are often combined with the electric grid using excess electricity for stored heat. Uh, the, the, the global status report focuses primarily on renewables. We also include a chapter on energy efficiency, as it is similarly a crucial part of the energy transition equation. Um, and though it's not a perfect measure, energy intensity is used to measure energy efficiency globally. In 2015, global primary energy intensity improved by 2.6%, which is the average rate that needs to be achieved between 2010 and 2030 to meet the Sustainable Development Goal 7 target of doubling the rate of improvement in energy efficiency. However, between 2010 and 2015, energy intensity declined by only 10.2% overall, an average annual rate of 2.1%. So improvement is still needed to reach the target. By the end of 2016, at least 149 countries had enacted one or more energy efficiency targets including 56 that adopted a new target in 2015 or 2016. As of 2016, at least 40 countries had dedicated energy efficiency funds led by Germany's development bank, KFW. Um, and for example, uh, in 2016, Ukraine worked to develop an energy efficiency fund for district heating and related energy efficiency activities. Uh, also, the International Finance Corporation offered technical assistance to uh, Serbia to boost the energy efficiency of public buildings, street lighting, and district heating. By the end of 2016, at least 137 countries had some kind of energy efficiency policy. Um, and what's not shown here is subnational activity, with cities accounting for 65% of the world energy consumption and for more than half of the world population. Um, so in general, urbanization has been a driver of an improved energy efficiency. And uh, where appropriate, district heating and cooling systems uh, allow greater energy efficiency and penetration of renewables than is possible for a single building in these cities. Um, but the challenges remain as urbanization continues, particularly in Africa, where many cities may be vulnerable to sprawl and where infrastructure development may be lagging. Finally, while um, power systems have always had to accommodate variable renewables in both uh, supply and demand, the, the growing adoption of variable renewables is changing how traditional established power systems are planned, designed, and operated. And as I mentioned early, Earlier, the interest in district heating is expanding as a way to provide flexibility in power systems by storing energy from the electric power grid as heat, and this is reflecting the increased interest in the electrification of the heating sector. So in conclusion, this year has shown that a global energy transition is still well underway. There were new record additions of installed renewable energy capacity and rapidly falling costs, particularly for solar PV and wind power. Um, these developments are accelerating the paradigm shift away from a world run on fossil fuels. However, the share of renewables in total final energy consumption is not growing as quickly as it needs to be. And efforts in the heating and cooling and transport sectors in particular are not advancing fast enough. Climate commitments can only be reached if the majority of remaining fossil fuel reserves are kept in the ground, and both renewable energy and energy efficiency will have to be scaled up dramatically. So to accelerate the transition to a healthier, more secure, and climate-safe future, we therefore need to build a smarter, more flexible system that maximizes the use of variable sources of renewable energy and accommodates both centralized as well as decentralized and community-based 
generation. So with that, I'd like to invite you all to, enjoy, to join the REN21 network today. You can subscribe to our newsletter, newsletter to get regular updates about renewable energy developments globally. And you can download all of our reports, infographics, uh, and other documents from our website. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hannah, for this comprehensive overview. Um, I think we don't have any questions for the moment, uh, so maybe we can just uh, pass to our next speaker. And if you have questions, um, then at the end of the of the webinar, after the last presentation, we will have uh, a question and answer session where where we will have the opportunity to ask all these all these unresolved uh, questions. So our next our next speaker is Laure Deschantre. Laure is an energy and environmental engineer. She studied at the Institute of Applied Science of Strasbourg, and since 2012 she is working for the Standby Research Institute Solidus and she um, she focuses on her work on system simulation, market development and solar district heating. So please Laure, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, well, thanks for this opportunity to talk to you about solar district heating and to give you an overview of the activities in the Horizon 2020 project as the HP2M. Um, I'd like to start by telling you why we focus on this technology and why we believe it's important to develop it and what's the high potential it has to contribute to the energy transition. Uh, first, why, why district heating? Um, it is clear now that we need renewable heat supply um, and that energy efficiency in buildings will not, will not be enough. Um, we, will need it, we need it now and we will need it uh, in the future. And district heating is one of the key technology that allows the integration of renewable energies and also waste heat at large scale in a quick and cost effective way, mostly because it's um, very flexible and um, well, because of the scaling effects it creates. Then about solar thermal energy. Um, the advantages of solar thermal energy are also clear, of course, emission-free and renewable, but also it brings the heat production back at local level, um, meaning money and jobs staying in the regions. Um, it's possible everywhere, sun is available everywhere at the moment. Uh, most of the solar district heating plants are installed in the countries that have the least uh, solar radiation in, in Europe. And um, it's a mature technology available on the market. Many plants have been operating since more than 25 years. Uh, know that we know the technology, we know it's working, and it's really available on the market now. There are several manufacturers offering everything from just the collectors um, to turnkey uh, installations and even to contracting, selling directly heat to the district heating operator. There are plans um, with the power up to 150 megawatts. This is the largest plant in Denmark, in Silkeborg. And uh, solar fraction can be reached up to 50%. It reaches on the market stable heat costs around uh, 50 euros per megawatt hours. What is really important in this um, sentence is uh, the word stable. This is one of the reasons why uh, district heating operators are really interested in the moment in this technology because on the first day uh, of operation you know your costs for the next 25 years. Um, well, and I can mention there are new opportunities um, opening on the market 
um, due to the electricity market developments uh, and the many renewables on the market. About the solar district heating market itself, um, well, this was the status in May 2016 in, in Europe. Um, you can see that uh, one the leading country is of course Denmark. Uh, Denmark reached one million of square meter installed last autumn, feeding into district heating networks. But also, also in Germany, there is at the moment a very interesting situation and um, quite a, a boom of the technology, let's say. Um, Bioenergy villages are getting interested in uh, installing solar thermal to cover their load in the summer. And also uh, in big cities in uh, urban areas, decentralized plants are starting to be inside, like the largest plant in Germany at the moment in Zentenberg. Um, um, and then, well, in the project, we also have uh, some countries like uh, France, uh, where there are the first plant and things are developing quite fast and are really promising. Um, I will not talk longer about so district heating itself. It's clear that uh, this technology is. Um, working on a technical point of view, maybe Jan Olof will give you some information more about that. In any case, you can, if you have any question about the technical side of this technology, you can always contact us or any of the project partners or consult the website. There are many guides that have been uh, developed about this. I will now come to um, our activities in the field of market development of this technology. And I would like to start by telling you that we, <laughs> we come from very far, because uh, the first um, European solar district heating project began in 2009. Um, and the aim was to start a cooperation between the solar thermal sector and the district heating sector, who were two sectors that never heard from each other before, apparently. And we had some very lonely moments at the first first district heating fairs where we had a solar district heating stand where nobody wanted any information about uh, solar district heating. And um, we come a long, we've come a long way because at the moment when we go to the solar district heating fair, it was, it is then with all the manufacturers that offer uh, solar, district, solar collectors for district heating feed in and take a lot of space and have a lot of uh, interest. In 2012, the um, SDH Plus project began. Um, it's focused on business models and also um, enlarged the number of countries participating. And um, in SDHP 2 m which started in 2016 in January, we are focusing on the policy side of things. In order to do that, we focused uh, on regional authorities with uh, nine regions in Europe involved. Um, why we do we focus on the regional level is well, because uh, it's easier to move things forward than at national level, but it's still a level where you have you can have impact on on the policy and not just um, at a city level or at a village level. Um, the aim. Um, well, we have three regions directly as project partner, which helps a lot with the impact, uh, but I will come back to that later. And the aim is, of course, to develop policy and support measures um, and to 
well, learn lessons from this development and the successful measures um, will be available for other EU region um, to replicate or uh, at national level in the countries. So uh, the goal is of course to establish solar thermal as a normal heat producer in district heating and cooling markets. Um, and where well, we aim at that the solar district heating is taken into account in urban planning and heat planning. Um, and local authorities are often very interested in, in renewable heat but they don't know how to promote them on their own territory uh, from the policy point of view. And this is what we are trying to find out and to disseminate to all other regions outside of the project. So basically <laughs> where we are now is that we know where uh, where we started because at the very beginning of the project we made a survey and uh, of, the, of the situation in the different regions. Uh, we know where we want to go we want towards market development of solar district heating with technology. Um, we know what the obstacles on the way are because um, also it, in the first phase of the project we analyzed, the, the regional teams analyzed together with the stakeholder groups the, um, in the regions, the barriers to market development at local level. And now what we need uh, is to implement um, measures to counter this barrier, to uh, make things move forward. And one of the very important uh, things to make things move forward is to have a good team to pedal the bike. Um, I wanted to well, present you one of these teams. This is the, the French one in Auvergne Rhone Alpes. Um, and what is really important in the team in SDHP2M is the different uh, partners to have the right persons to move things forward. Um, here we have Alexi from the region directly. Um, and then we have uh, Mathieu from um, the energy agency of the region and Cédric from the research institute on solar thermal energy. And altogether, well, they have the, the right connection and the right um, network in the region to put people together and to really move things forward. And uh, well, um, we can wish them good luck because they are uh, living in a region with really high mountains and um, legendary passes like the Col du Galibier. I don't know if you're watching the Tour de France maybe at the moment. So as I said, um, in all the regions um, there were active stakeholder groups uh, gathered and they worked together on a detailed actions plan to address uh, all the barriers to market development of solar district heating. At the moment this imp the implementation of this action plan is going on and um, we have some topics that gather the regions uh, over boundaries um, in all the different countries. For example, many regions are working on the problematics of finding areas for solar thermal uh, collectors. Like uh, it's a big focus for the Hamburg region uh, and also for Austria, for example, um, how to adapt the regulation to support uh, the implementation of renewable um, plans for district heating. Uh, also, some regions are working on financing models for solar district heating plans. Another very important aspect is uh, capacity buildings of market actors, uh, local authorities, but also uh, district heating operators, uh, planners, architects, and so on. 
Um, this is a mission of information that is very uh, well ongoing in France and in Bulgaria, for example. Um, they are trying to institutionalize this um, capacity building, these trainings about what is street heating. Um, also, some guidelines are developed in some regions like uh, Ronalp and Thuringen in Germany. And uh, one of the very important tools on which uh, most of the um, regions with a small market at the moment are really working uh, hard is uh, the realization of feasibility studies that should lead to uh, the realization of pilot plans in the regions. Pilot plans are really important when talking about market development because there is nothing better than to see with your own eyes that it's working and to meet the people um, next door that have also uh, realized this plant and are operating it so that um, you also decide to that it could be a solution for you. Um, all these measures that are being developed in the SDHPTM project will be really soon available online as um, text sheets. So if you are, are interested, uh, you can go to the website and download them. Um, let's go to the page where you can see the website. Um, so, if you're interested in the technology or in the activities of the solar distributing from policy to market project, of course, you can contact us. Um, you can also go to the website, which has a lot of information and a lot of um, project results updated regularly. And, of course, you can attend one of our events. There are many organized at national level but also at international level. And with this, I would like to invite you to the fifth solar district heating conference, which will take place in Graz, in Austria, on 11th and 12th of April, 2018. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Lor. Um, so then uh, we just passed to our last speaker, uh, Professor Jan Olof Dallenbach. He is a professor in Building Services Engineering in Chalmers University of Technology. His focus areas are building energy renovation and solar energy for buildings. And he was awarded in 2005 with the International Energy Agency Social, uh, Solar Heating and Cooling Award. So please, uh, Jan Olof, the screen is yours. <clears throat> well, hello everyone. Um, I will try to make a more combined uh, policy and technical description of the solar district heating. Um, in general, as we partly heard from the RAN presentation, uh, there is very much focus on electricity and it's only the last years and we have a better focus on heating and cooling to become more renewable. And the fact is that 70% of the, the citizens in Europe live in urban areas which are suitable for district heating. Uh, we have 6,000 district heating systems and they only cover 12 to 14 percent of our heat demands. So there is a large potential to use more district heating. And this map shows the district heating, the 6,000 district heating systems in Europe. They are all over but less in the southern parts of course. And uh, at the moment, there is about 100 systems that use solar heat. Um, <clears throat> the advantage of district heating and the re uh, requirements for district heating is to have a dense building area where you have a heat demand which uh, allows to build a distribution system and a heating plant. 
Um, it's very simple. You circulate hot water in a distribution network. In principle, it's similar to uh, the electricity network, but it's uh, much more regional. You cannot distribute heat from from Sahara to Norway. And this is a simple schematics of a block or district heating system. Uh, you have a heating plant, you have connections in all buildings, and you circulate hot water. This is a practical example. The city of Stockholm, which has a district heating network with about uh, 40 um, kilometers wide and in both uh, east, west and north, south directions with uh, more than five different district heating plants. Um, <clears throat> the district heating is very flexible because you can use different and you can change the heat sources. Uh, the most common application in district heating is to use combined heat and power and unfortunately with fossil fuels in most cases. But it's more and more common to use uh, bioenergy for combined heat and power. Heat only boilers with all types of fuels. Same thing here, you can replace uh, fossil boilers with renewable boilers. Uh, it gives the opportunity to use waste heat from industries and um, with um, an increasing uh, amount of waste, waste insulation is one possibility and you can use that in district heating. You can use large heat pumps with different sources and in uh, right now solar heat of course is the one is, that is in focus. Um, Solar district heating, that's a common district heating network where you apply a solar collector array. You can either connect it in the heating plant or it can be connected to the heat distribution system. And uh, you combine it with the storage to increase the use of solar heat. That is to reduce the mismatch between the uh, available solar energy and the demand of heat. And uh, <clears throat> this map shows um, all large solar heating systems in Europe. Um, about half of the yellow dots are um, solar heating used in district heating systems. And as you have seen before, Denmark is dominating um, the solar district heating market. And uh, then, of course, it's a good question, why a small country like Denmark? Well, Denmark is, um, has relied in many, many uh, years, centuries, for gas, for district heating. And now they try to get rid of the natural gas, so they have very high taxes on natural gas, so it's expensive to use natural gas both in combined heat and power and for uh, heat only boilers in district heating. And uh, at the same time they have a very high share of wind power which uh, makes the electricity price go up and down and uh, when it's really blowing a lot and the electricity price is low then it's not feasible to run combined heat and power and then solar heat especially solar heat with storage comes into the picture. And this shows, this map shows about the same thing, but now we see the uh, solar radiation in Europe. Um, the red parts in the south, you have more solar radiation, but you also have less heat demands. And uh, the numbers, they show the largest uh, solar heating and cooling plants in Europe all with more than one megawatt nominal thermal power. So Denmark is dominating with more than 100 and uh, in the south you can see four large um, cooling plants uh, where you use solar heat to uh, drive uh, absorption chillers. 
Um, the most common application of solar district heat is a collector array and a buffer storage with a rather small volume in, in connection to collector area. In most typical district heating systems, you cover 10 to 20% of the annual district heating load with the solar part. Um, in order to cover a larger part of the annual district heating load, you need to uh, implement a seasonal storage with a larger volume of storage in relation to the collector area. In really large district heating systems, there's also the possibility to uh, connect the collector array um, directly to the district heating system. Uh, it is in principle in the same way as you connect the PV system to the electric grid. The difference is that you use a heat exchanger instead of an inverter. In this case, the fraction of the, the district heating load that you can cover depends, of course, on the size of the collector array and the size of the district heating system. And if we look on um, the um, number of plants um, in these different categories, uh, it's the first type with the buffer storage is dominating and then about 10% of the plants uh, are with seasonal storage and about 10% are uh, connected directly to district heating. Um, but the largest plants uh, by far are those with uh, seasonal storage. <clears throat> the most common type is where you connect the uh, solar uh, collector array to the uh, central heating plant. Um, typically, it may uh, build it in connection to the heating plant, and uh, you build a storage in connection to the heating plant. In uh, smaller systems, um, also in larger sometimes, it's also possible to uh, install the collectors on buildings which are close to the heating plant. And uh, I will show some examples. I will start with a very small district heating or block heating system. It's a, a system which was built in 1995 in Sweden. To the left here you see a wood pellet boiler plant and a car port. Uh, both are covered with roof integrated collectors and uh, they provide the about 20% of the annual heat for 36 residential units. Oops, um, and here is another example about from the same time, 1997. It's a new building area in uh, Germany. And in this case, you see a lot of solar collectors and um, this system is using a seasonal storage. So it's providing more than half of the heat, annual heat demand of the new area from solar. And then we, if you go more than 10 years forward in time. And um, this is an example of a new district heating system, which was built in a small town or a huge village in Sweden. Um, on the left, you see the heating plant with a 200 cubic meter water tank. That's a buffer storage. And on, on to the right, you see the collector array about 1,000 square meter, which in this case is uh, mounted on the ground. And uh, about at the same time, um, a residential area uh, with a roof integrated solar collectors uh, and a wood pellet boiler plant was built in, uh, in Valda Heberg in Sweden. Uh, and this uh, wood pellet boiler plant, it also has some uh, collectors on the facade. And what is interesting with this uh, small um, town or large village, Valda Heberg, is that they have an existing plant in operation, which was built 30 years ago. So uh, it proves that the systems work. 
Um, <clears throat> this picture shows probably the most uh, well-known solar district heating plant uh, in Marstal in Denmark. Uh, you can see that there are two collector rays um, and the um, oops the um, the first 17,000 square meter were built mainly in two phases, one in 1996 and one in 2003. And uh, then in 2013, another 15,000 square meter and a seasonal storage was built. So you, you see that the uh, solar district heating plant can be extended. You can start with a smaller size and then you can extend it by time or depending on other things. And also in this case, um, there was a plant, a similar plant with a similar collector array built in Sweden in 1983. That's 30 years earlier than the plant in Marstal right now. And here's another example of a large plant in Denmark. It's about the same size as Marstal. Um, and then this plant was built in 2014 and uh, in 2015 and 2016 first a plant in Voyens with twice the size was built and then in 2016 uh, another plant again twice in size uh, was built in Denmark and uh, the plant in Silkeborg with 150,000 square meter collectors or 100 megawatt of nominal thermal power is the largest solar heating system in the world. Um, on the bottom right you see a, a small note, city. And the city is in that direction. And if we use Google, then we get the picture of uh, Denmark. This is the city of Dronninglund. And here to the left, you can see the solar heating plant, which covers about 60% of the annual heat demand of uh, the city. And I will come back to this uh, relation between uh, how large systems and uh, the space you need. As I said before, it's also possible to um, connect solar heating systems in the heat distribution network. If it's a large network and you have some suitable areas close to the district heating network, you can connect um, where it's suitable. And if we take, uh, if we have a lot of distributed systems, then you need to um, install a storage somewhere in the system also. And if we take an example of a large building, in this case it's supposed to be a typical uh, residential multifamily building with the heating system to the left and the hot water system and a simplified district heating substation. If you mount solar collectors on the roof, you can connect the uh, solar collectors directly to the heat distribution system. And if the heat demand for space heating and hot water is larger in the building than the um, heat that can be provided by the solar collectors, then the building will get the rest from the district heating network. And if the um, solar heat provided by the solar collectors is larger than the need in the buildings for the time being, then uh, the, uh, ex the excess heat will uh, be distributed in the district heating uh, system to other buildings. And this is an example from Graz uh, where um, collectors are mounted on the roofs of a recycling station and the solar system is connected to the district heating network in Graz. If we make a SWOT of solar district heating, um, <clears throat> Lohr partly mentioned different things which are characteristic and the strength is solar heat and solar energy in general that it's very um, 
democratic. You have more or less the same amount of solar radiation everywhere, and you have you get a fixed cost. Uh, the weakness um, of solar energy, as with all renewable energy sources, is that the energy density is very low and in the case of solar energy the utilization time when you actually can generate solar energy is short. Um, but regarding the low energy density, um, biofuels they require 30 to 50 or sometimes 100 times the land area to generate the same amount of heat. And if you remember the Google map with the uh, Dronning Lund and the solar system providing 60% of the annual heat to Dronning Lund, uh, if you would like to use biofuels, you would need to have four m maps of bioenergy fields around the city. Uh, the opportunities to um, have this uh, renewable energy in district heat. Bioenergy and solar heat are the most um, feasible alternative to the fossil fuels in district heat in villages and cities and with the district heat combined with solar heat you uh, have a large system which is much more feasible than to have one uh, solar system on each building and the main threat is, uh, as most of the renewables, it's the uh, lack of incentives and the lack of knowledge and um, interest. And it goes uh, all the way from policy, decision makers, utilities, everyone. Um, another threat, uh, which is mainly related to district heating, is that you have gas networks all over. and. Um, that's hard to get rid of. The only country is, which is trying to get rid of the networks right now is Denmark. Uh, and then of course we have a lot of waste heat which also is a threat to use um, solar heat. In some cases the waste heat is, uh, you get paid to use it. Um, regarding the um, <clears throat> low energy density, if we take this picture with a solar collector array and then a lot of bioenergy around. Um, if we transform the uh, energy in biofuels to heat electricity and fuels, uh, you need 40 to 1 megawatt hour per hectare and year in order to get heat, electricity or fuels. Uh, if we instead uh, convert the solar radiation directly into heat or electricity in a solar collector or a PV module, uh, you generate 200 to 500 megawatt hours per hectare and year, which is a considerable difference. Uh, the trick to utilize this is to have a storage. Um, Regarding opportunities, it's a mature and operational technology since 25, 30 years. So EU and city planners can or should consider district heating first and solar district heating. The district heating developers, they can or should use solar heat as a driver or complement in order to make district heating feasible and the solar collector developers, they can or should increase their market by developing district heating applications. And th that is what is happening right now. And then I would emphasize what Laura said, uh, the fifth uh, solar district heating conference will take place in Austria in um, April next year. Um, since many years we have well adopted collector arrays both on, on ground and on buildings. Uh, we have feasible cost due to scale um, but we lack the policy and incentives and knowledge and that's what we are trying to help with the SDH P2M project. Um, <clears throat> the key factors are to uh, um, to use district heating, to find a space and uh, the right type of storage. And uh, once again, if you remember the Google map, uh, you see that this space is, um, it's a matter of thinking in another direction. And instead of, um, 
Well, you, you, if you try to find out how many square meter of uh, golf fields you have in your country, that would uh, make a big difference if you transform them into solar collector arrays. So come and learn about the latest solar district heating developments in uh, Austria next spring. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jan Olof. I think uh, now we can we have still some minutes for some question and answer. So please feel free to just write your your questions in the comment session. Um, we have uh, two questions, so I'm just uh, going to read them out loud. Uh, the first one. So this question is from Pascual Polo, uh, Secretary General of ACID, the Solar Thermal Industry Association in Spain. And he asks um, what kind of support um, they can get to promote solar district heating in Spain. I don't know, maybe uh, Hannah from REN21 or Lore, uh, you have some some ideas for for Mr. Polo or perhaps uh, Jan Olof as well? Uh, yeah, this is Hannah Murdoch from REN21. Um, I, I can speak generally about the data that we have available that could be used as um, uh, maybe an opportunity for, for benchmarking for, uh, uh, for what could be done in Spain. Um, but in terms of, of uh, other support, there, I mean, there are certain funds that are available, but I think that probably Lore or Jan Olaf would have uh, more specific information than I could provide right now. Well, in the um, SDH project, was it really important that you connect uh, your sector, the solar thermal sector, with the district heating sector? As far as I know, this one is uh, really small in Spain. Um, so first, uh, maybe take contact with the other side. <laughs> and then um, in the SDH Plus project, um, Spain uh, was a, a project member and Technalia was a project partner and there were many studies made as to the market at the moment and the potential for development of solar district heating and also um, some um, materials, uh, training materials for uh, urban planners and um, district heating operators have been developed in Spanish and are available on the website um, on the platform that I had before on my slide uh, on the Spanish website but also on the European website you can find them. Um, so you have quite a lot of um, material for promotion already. Um, well, if you want to um, contact us to think about who um, you need to contact with this promotion material, maybe we can discuss that. Maybe uh, Jan Olof, you would like to add something to the question? And no, I just uh, want to emphasize uh, what Lor said. You should utilize the um, web page of the platform and get in contact either with some of the, uh, I mean, the, the co uh, contractor um, Solites and Lor, or you can contact me directly and we will try to help you to find other people in Spain. Thank you for your replies. Uh, then we have uh, another question that comes from Hannah, uh, and it's a question for, for you, Young Olaf, so I will just uh, read it out loud. Uh, you mentioned that Denmark is seeing a lot of activity in district heating because of the tasks on, uh, on natural gas. However, could you discuss more about the cost competitiveness of district heating versus fossil fuel alternatives? Yeah, I, I will try. I mean, the situation is that uh, most of the district heating systems have been using combined heat and power based on natural gas. And um, when there is a tax on natural gas and the electricity price is low, 
then you are not able to operate combined heat and power. And if you're using the combined heat and power to heat up a city, you need to have something else to heat up the city. And the first alternative is to use a gas boiler. Uh, but if you start to implement the storage, then you can uh, utilize the combined heat and power in a better way. And you can also uh, utilize uh, heat pumps. And uh, when you have a storage, the solar collector array is, uh, is paid on its own because it's just providing heat. And um, they operate the Danish plant when, the, when there is a low heat, uh, low price of electricity, they operate heat pumps and the solar heating system. And when there is a high price of electricity, they operate the combined heat and power. And then they have the storage to balance between these different uh, operations. And the cost competitive is that uh, a large collector of solar um, heat um, is a lower uh, cost than uh, operating a natural gas boiler. Thank you very much for your reply. Um, we have another question. I will read it also um, out loud for those that um, are connecting with uh, their phones. Uh, this is Francesca Salcedo working at the Energy Department of Skanska in Sweden. I have seen a great increase in the use of PV in the buildings due to the decrease in prices and that is an easy technology but I haven't seen that much use of solar thermal. My question is if it is, if it is better to invest more in solar application directly in the district heating system instead of, direct, instead of directly installation in buildings in Sweden. Yeah, I guess um, Jan Olof should reply to that answer, to uh, reply with an answer to that. Uh, well, the situation is, in Sweden is that um, we have a lot of district heating and uh, the majority of the district heating systems are based on wood fuels and very cheap wood fuels. So it's really hard to compete with solar heat in district heating systems, especially in the large ones. Um, and if you want to put uh, either PV or solar collectors on buildings. I mean, when there is a suitable building, then you can use an uh, existing infrastructure, which is, of course, in a, is an advantage, either to make a large PV plant or to make a large solar collector array and connect it to the district heating. I mean, PV generates electricity and uh, solar heat generates, or solar collectors generate heat. So they don't compete. Thank you, Jan Olof. Um, we have another question. This time is a question for Hannah. I will read it out loud. Um, with many countries, especially developing countries, a lack of qualified and skilled workforce to support the development of the renewable energy sector, what positive uh, steps are you seeing uh, that are being taken, especially uh, more so in tertiary education? Uh, yeah, this is one of the things that we often see in is that there's a need for, for training um, to occur for, for renewables to, to have more uh, deployment in developing countries. Um, unfortunately, I mean, we don't have so much data on this at the moment. The data is uh, uh, difficult to get a hold of, but I, I could get in touch with um, the person that's asked this question offline and perhaps provide a, a better answer. Thank you, Hannah. And then we have one last question. Um, that is, uh, what is the percentage of heat loss in the district heating system? And how does this vary with the flow return temperature circulating? I don't know, maybe uh, Jan Olof or Lor uh, could reply to this question? 
Well, I can start. Um, a, a typical district heating system in a, a large district heating system, the uh, heat losses in the heat distribution system is about 10%. Um, that's about the same um, losses that you have in an uh, electric grid. Um, in smaller systems in Denmark, um, they um, have lower temperatures in the heat distribution network. So in that case, they sometimes allow 20% heat losses in the system. So it's more depending on how you design the how you design the district heating system with the heat density than with the temperature. Um, it should be high um, heat density, but of course the temperature makes a difference also. And it's all, a low temperature improves the performance of a solar heating system. Thank you. I don't know, Lor, would you like to add something? No, no, it's, uh, I would have answered the same. <laughs> okay. Well, then I think for the moment we don't have more questions. Uh, so I would like just to make a, a final question to the three of you, just to take some um, some takeaways uh, with us uh, from the webinar. So the question is, what is from your perspective um, the actions that the EU or the national governments uh, should do um, or should change at the policy level to support the implementation of solar district heating? Well, Jan Olof, I can start to answer, and uh, on a very general uh, level, is to uh, to have tax on carbon dioxide all over. That's the most general and most effective. Um, then, yeah, the the uh, the uh, there there has to be a greater interest for district heating, and there are many um, projects ongoing. Um, like the heat roadmap of Europe and uh, the uh, district heating, uh, district heating and cooling plus platform and so on. So I guess that's where you should go if you want to know. Thank you, Jan. Uh, Jan Olof, um, Lor or Hannah, could you like to comment on this? Uh, yes, this is Hannah. Um, I would just add that. Um, uh, to add on what Jan Olaf has said, um, maybe a more effective carbon price uh, more broadly could could have more of an impact. Um, and also, since Denmark has had much success uh, and some countries are already um, trying to emulate the, their success, that would, they could use this as a as a model. Um, and then, more generally, for the heating sector, uh, we've seen that there's there's much less emphasis on that sector uh, than for power or for transport. And so um, increasing policy support uh, more broadly could uh, help the sector get more renewables um, at the European level. Thank you, Hannah. Uh, Lor, could you like to say something? Um, well, man, maybe I agree with all that was said um, at a more local problem, I would say, but this is a general problem that in, seems to be met in most of the country is uh, the question of uh, finding areas for um, energy and it seems that uh, there is no, not a lot of readiness to use areas to produce energy, but um, as Jan Olaf mentioned, solar heat is uh, the renewable energy that uh, is the most efficient um, in terms of areas needed. So, uh, well, there is to maybe have a, a development towards the acceptance that we need areas for producing energies. Well, yeah, thank I you agree. very much. Yeah. <laughs> 
Well, thank you very much. Uh, we are running out of time, so I would like just to conclude this, this webinar by thanking you uh, very much to the speakers and to the attendees for taking the time today to attend the webinar. Uh, the presentations and the recording will be available tomorrow on our website. You will receive uh, an email with the with the instructions and with the with the links. And uh, well, I think after the the three presentations, we can we can all agree that although solar district heating is is still a small uh, part in terms of market shares. Um, in Europe, but also globally, uh, is 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 a mature technology, you know, with with a lot of potential. So, um, more efforts will be will be done to try to to reach this market uptake. Um, and thank you very much again for for being here today. And um, I hope to see you soon in one of our next webinars. Thank you. Thank you.